Alexandra Show. I'm your host, Alexandra, and today we have a very special guest, one of my personal coaches, Madison Ciccone, and we are going to talk about all things behind the chair, on the bike, and beyond the bike. So stay tuned. Whatever. I feel like we work in experiential business yeah. in general. So yeah, I know so you yeah. 
been an experiential business. Yeah. Um, you yes, you want to foster, and you also want to build. So it's like this delicate balance mm -hmm. um, of nurturing always. Well, it's just like any relationship, as you were talking. Yeah. I'm like, it's just like a you know interpersonal relationship, whether it's a <laughs> friendship or a romantic relationship. You don't reach a destination and stop. Mm -hmm. It's like if you're courting someone and dating them. And then you get married. You gotta continue to date them. It's not a destiny. Yeah. <laughs> like it's not like yeah, final yeah. destination. Yeah. And then everything yeah. you did together, you just stop. Yeah. Because we slash that one. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So neither does it work with building a community and friendships and fostering that. And it makes such a big difference. And you know, not to throw shade or anything like that. But when I go to group fitness, it's to be part of a community. That's I could work out at home. I don't like to. It's not my jam. I love the energy of the people around me. And so when you go in and you not only are recognized by the instructor, but you see the same people in class yeah. and the high-fiving and fist bumping and all that stuff, it's it really does build a community and it, you feel supported and encouraged and it's really amazing. So Yeah, I do. It's like, um, thanks. I think also for me, I've always been part of team structure mm -hmm. in some way. So I call that the D1 spirit. Mm -hmm. And I talk about it a lot, especially in Soul Kid. Yes. Um, and just being a part of the team, you don't have to do it alone. You're practicing together. Mm -hmm. um, you're showing up together. I think that that really helps, especially on the harder days, you know, when we're feeling great, when we're feeling awesome in our bodies, when everything's going our way, it's very easy to show up and do all the things mm -hmm. we need to do. But then, on the days where it's tougher and heavier or crappy out or whatever, mm -hmm. the external circumstances, I yeah. call it like the external, the environment is environmenting or whatever it yeah. is, that's when you need your team to kind of like push you. Totally. We brought up a great point and that's exactly what I wanted to talk about. <laughs> so I would love for you to talk a little bit about Soul Hit to explain to people what it is. And what I love about what you're talking about is, you know, if there's a lot of parallels between fitness and working out and life. Yeah. Kind of mental stuff. And to your point, it's like if you've signed up for a class and you don't know anyone else in that class and like the instructor doesn't remember your name when you go and you wake up in the morning and it's snowing or raining or whatever, or you went out last night or you're tired or there's a million reasons why, yeah. you're much more likely to just say like, eh, I'm not oh, going to go. Yeah. But if you know the instructor's going to notice your absence, if you know the person on the bike next to you and you don't want to leave them stranded because it's not as, like if you are there for energy and all the bikes around you are empty you're not getting the same energy and you, no. and you feel responsibility towards them and towards yourself you're so much more likely to show up yeah i think that's just accountability at, mm -hmm. at its finest um and i always say you don't want coaching like this it just takes the accountability uh, it, t it just takes it to another level um and makes you just want to show up more, and I get what you mean. It's almost that reverse, like FOMO, but not yeah. FOMO. It's like if you're missing out, it's more like it is. It's like the fear of not being there. So yeah, it's going to someone's going to notice or affect it. So it's mm -hmm. almost like reverse in a way. Mm -hmm. um, but I call it like the elements are elementing. So again, I, I just think the perils for me, why I felt like this has worked for me over the years is I've always been a part of sports. Sport has mm -hmm. always been in me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I call it team one spirit, heart of the champion, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, that has helped me on the days where it's extremely hard mm -hmm. because I know that, I, I know in my heart of hearts, like even when it's a really hard practice or like, I hate this right now, like I don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. I always feel better after. Mm -hmm. Always, even if I'm at home and I don't want to move on like the days I have quote unquote off now, mm -hmm. um, I know that if I get up and just do like 30 minutes on my at-home bike or whatever it is, I know I'm going to feel better. Absolutely. Yeah. Getting so. what is in motion stays in motion or something? Yes. No, yes. Okay. Yes. Obviously <laughs> motion stays in motion. <laughs> Woo! Forward movement. <laughs> so tell us what Soul Hit is because I have been, a, I don't know how long, but tw a, lo a long time. Yeah. Pre-COVID, I've been a devotee Wednesday morning, 7 a.m. I'm like, yeah, because I get yes. so much out of it, which I want to get into, but I want you to explain to everyone what it is because it's different than normal Soul Cycle. Yes, so soul, soul Hit first started as Soul Activate, mm -hmm. and basically it's you know high intensity interval training on a bike. So I relate it to um, if you've ever done the assault bike mm -hmm. or you've ripped the cord and you have to push the you know the, the treadmill, the treadmill yes. or like pushing the sled. It's mm -hmm. a lot more like to me. Like I don't know how to describe it other than no, that is that actual that is it. <laughs> so. Um, and the format came out about, I want to say, maybe 2017. Yeah. So it's been around for quite some time. A lot of 
people no longer teach it. It yeah. kind of like went away and was supposed to have a resurgence. We gave it a new name. We were supposed to have this huge rebranding. It never happened. So now I just feel like I'm just this rogue warrior teaching this <laughs> random <laughs> format modality class. Yeah. Um, and I've continued to teach it literally because of the community that shows up for it. It's this like group of really crazy wild athletes <laughs> that want to do this really intense but really rewarding workout. And so I've continued to teach it and I put on a different like coach hat and made it like a whole like I try to make it feel so different than my other yeah. classes. And it does. Um yeah. So and I do and now that we're talking I'm like I thought I gave you a whistle. Yeah you did. I'm like that I have it in my never, drawer. It's never I have a whistle in my drawer. Because she <laughs> and Madison is like a full coach. Yeah. Like you don't typically ride in the class mm -hmm. um and you're down on the floor coaching and really getting into the mental game of it because yeah. it is so mental. And that's what I love so much, the parallels. And, and you always say that. You're like, everyone in this class, you're here for a reason. Mm -hmm. And you have to have a why. Because a thousand percent. What are you pushing for? And for me, it's different all the time. And I've worked through, I've worked through a lot. <laughs> Good. Yes. Very, some very, you know, like personal stuff, you know, like coming to class immediately after losing someone, you know, like some a family member passing away and being able to, you know, like help process that. And mm -hmm. then with the birth of Petaluda, um, there was a lot of frustration on the path to get here. Yeah. Uh -huh. And there were so many times that I just would close my eyes in class and like visualize and visualize mm -hmm. and visualize and like, okay, I'm getting a call from the landlord. It's happening. You know, like yes. and just visualize oh, things. And, so then, and then to be on the other side of that now to our previous conversation, like that's never going to stop. I'm always going to be wanting more and striving for more. But to be in class and be like, holy shit, a year ago, I was wanting and wishing and visualizing and like working towards this. And like, it's a real thing now. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. So thank you for that You're space. Welcome. I'm glad I could provide that yeah. space. Um, yeah, it's really, it's really cool. And I think that that has so much to do with movement. I, I say this little line, and I know you know it a lot, like, when you move your body, you change your breath. When you change your breath, you change your state, change your state, change your mindset, change your mindset, change your life. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that. And um, I think what I talk about so much in Soul Hit is really going back again to those like sport roots that like to visualize yourself where you want to be, how you want to feel, like put yourself in that place mm -hmm. before you do it. And I even do this now before I go speak on stages or if I go to mm -hmm. different companies and do workshops. I literally sit in my room and I'm sure if my house was bugged, I sound like a psychopath. <laughs> um, literally, I'm like, I hope my neighbors are on the house. Like, what's going on? Getting a full like Tony Robbins performance. Yeah. But I literally like picture myself, what do I want to wear? Like, what am I, what does my hair look like? Like, what, what am I bringing with me? What did, what might the room look like? And I put myself there. Mm -hmm. And then when I'm there, it really, it makes such a difference. Yeah. Like you said, like, I, I'm picturing getting the, the message from the landlord. I'm mm -hmm. picturing maybe the butterflies. What are they going to look like on the walls? Like, mm -hmm. that stuff is so, so important. And it goes right back to sport. Visualize yourself where you want to be. And then you'll most likely get there. And yeah. I think that is a little bit of manifestation, but I kind of have a little bit of trouble with manifestation because I think so many people mm. don't put themselves in action. Mm. Like they think, oh, mm. I'll just like visualize yeah, it. Yeah, they're like, um, I'm <laughs> Yeah, but then I think that's where the movement but you comes gotta to go. play. You gotta be in action. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So when those two are perfectly paired, I think that's, that's when the magic happens. Yeah, and it's interesting too as you're talking about sports. I did not play sports growing up. <laughs> like everyone tried to put me in sports because I was always like one of the tallest, like one of the tallest three girls in the game, like taller than all the boys. So yeah. I'm like, well, yeah, Awesome. He was awesome. Um, <laughs> but so people were always trying to get me into sports, and I was like, man, I don't like it. Like, me, like, man. And I was like, hit people and not, and I wasn't good at it. And yeah. it's interesting because I noticed a shift in myself. I look, and I, I did dance. That's a, that I and I do, I mean, and it is a sport. It is a sport, but it's not like a team ball. Like, er, yeah, I get that. Um, and, but I remember, and I can't pinpoint like a, a specific shift. But it happened for me later in life where I used to hate doing things I wasn't good at. Mm. So if I wasn't good at something, I would just quit. I'd be like, nope, I'm not good, I quit. And I wouldn't push myself through that uncomfortable part. Yeah. And so like I said, I, can't, I, I should do some more reflection on this, but I can't pinpoint an exact time. But now in my life, I am very solidly aware that 
when you push through discomfort, and this isn't saying like push through injury. That's that's not. That's yeah, that's not what we're talking about. It's eye contact. Yeah. But when you push through discomfort, whether physically or mentally, like that's what it takes to get to the other side. Mm-hmm. And so that's why for me the parallel between fitness and working out to mental gain life strength is so strong because when you develop that mental and physical muscle it prepares you for uncomfortable things elsewhere in life yeah a hundred percent and i think there's so much mindset mental toughness that comes with physicality and doing Mm -hmm. these things Mm -hmm. um and that can go well beyond just like the Mm -hmm. actual act of it and then taking those principles out into the world yeah so i'd love to talk about so we we're we're like in the same generation um, and I don't want to make this like a generational hate thing because I, I don't, oh, yeah, I don't yeah. vibe on that. Yeah. However, I've noticed something interesting lately with younger generations, um, like not wanting to work in toxic work environments. And I okay. think that that phrase has become a little too, uh, widespread and like is being used a little too liberally in, from my experience yeah, and so. listening to people. And there are very distinct toxic work environments. Right, working for a narcissist, um, <laughs> working for a sexist, a homophobe, like all that kind of stuff. To me, that's toxic work environment. Totally. Um, but there's a big difference to me between that and like paying your dues to get where you need to go. Yeah. And I'd love for you to share your story because you didn't have like a direct path, which yeah. I think a lot of people don't. And you <laughs> started in LA. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so tell us a little bit about that because I'd love to hear yeah. your story and how it relates to what I. Oh, uh, this is so <laughs> challenging because I look back on a lot of things that I had to do to get to where I am, and of course now you're like, oh, I wish it didn't have to be so hard, or I wish it didn't have to, but I can't wish that away because I mm. wouldn't be the powerhouse I am now without all that shit. Like I wouldn't be. I saw I, I, sometimes the Instagram Bible just speaks to me. <laughs> And there's this one that was like, if I went back and erased all the hard things that happened to me, you wouldn't be who you are. I wouldn't exist. I wouldn't be who I am. Yeah. Like that. And I, 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 a thousand percent. It, yeah. So, you know, I started in LA. I was an executive assistant, so a glorified Hollywood assistant. I literally remember I actually like had my Starbucks coffee, this <laughs> huge sock button on my head, and I was like at my desk like. And I got written up in BuzzFeed as like yes. 10, I'll never forget, it was like, how do you know you're a, a Hollywood assistant? And it was like, and a bunch of my friends got written up in it too. It was so funny. So we were all like glorified Hollywood assistants, like going out every night, drinks, like all the things, like very, I would say like not a great cycle of like go yes. out, get wasted, get up, work all day, uh-huh. like getting lunches, planning all the things, like talking to all the celebrities. Like it was crazy. It was really crazy. And I feel like I've so many wild stories. So I did that for a while. Um, I then kind of made my way into like digital marketing, advertising, mm-hmm. still like middle level. Mm-hmm. And I kept getting let go. I got let go twice of like every year around like Thanksgiving-ish. Basically, if you don't get accounts in to like get more work, you know, mm-hmm. if we don't have money coming in, we can't pay everybody. And I always felt like I was like in this middle ground mm-hmm. of like not quite skilled enough, like, mm-hmm. like, I want to say, you know, the word I'm saying is worthy enough, but in that in itself is kind of messed up. But I was never, like, at that rung of, like, oh, whatever. I was always in that way of, like, oh, we can let these people go. <laughs> so, uh, eventually, I got let go from a digital marketing job. And I remember I was sitting in my car. I had a white Jetta at the time, which was very cliche. And I'm just, like, sitting at this parking lot in Hollywood, like, crying. My friends are like, Matt, saying, all you do is it. You do fitness 24, you go to the gym at 4 a.m. to work a 12-hour day to maybe go back and dance at night for fun. Like, <laughs> you need to be in this place. Yeah. And now, in between, I had worked at Equinox from Desk in West Hollywood, which in itself was like, that is the mecca. I've the mecca. There. I've been there. Yeah. Okay. I was where you want to be. <laughs> I danced in, like, weddings. Like, I got the craziest opportunities I working from there. Um, and so, I got my yoga teacher training license. I got a lot of different things, but eventually made my way to work as an assistant studio manager at SoulCycle. Mm-hmm. So left like this cushy Hollywood lifestyle mm-hmm. to go like spring shoes at SoulCycle, mm-hmm. for lack of better words. And that kind of led me into the journey of, you know, becoming an instructor and going to New York and building the brand here in Boston mm-hmm. and all that. Um, but there was so much that happened in LA. There was so many crazy bosses and so many 
hard times. Mm. I struggle with that question so much, Alexander, because I think the pendulum has swung too far to what's considered like toxic, or is it toxic, or is it just hard? Right. Or like, what's the difference between mm-hmm. being really challenging and really grueling versus actually quote unquote toxic? Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. really challenging because there's so many feelings and semantics caught up in it. Now, do I look back and I see like, wow, I was in some really sketchy situations in LA. And looking back, I'm like, damn, that, I don't know. Is that the fine line between? I'm not sure, but I also don't, again, I wouldn't be who I am today without them. So it's, it's such a tough thing to answer. Right. But I do think there is a huge difference between hard stuff slash challenging and quote unquote toxic. Right. Yeah, I agree. And, and it's, oh, there's a lot of good in there. Totally. And I agree with that. And I, that's a, it's a pretty big topic to, <laughs> to try to, to try to tackle. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I think, you know, listening to you talk about that, like saying you're able, because someone might say like, I'm not going to spray shoes. I mean, it was totally, it was totally, I was just so obsessed. I was like, I, if I get in at this level Mm -hmm. and I can, and and I never wanted to be an instructor. I Mm -hmm. wanted to do like social media and marketing. My, my ploy was like, I'm going to get in Mm -hmm. and then I'm going to transfer to New York headquarters. Mm -hmm. I'll be closer to home. My family's in Rhode Island. It's all going to work out. Marketing and advertising. But then I started to write podium for all these master and senior instructors Mm -hmm. and everybody kept asking me. That's Mm -hmm. the knock I talk about. Listen to what people Mm -hmm. say about you. Because if you Mm -hmm. are like, I don't know what I want, I guarantee people around you are going to tell you exactly where you should be based on the skills they see in you that you don't see in yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I never saw this person on the podium. Like how physically I, I couldn't do that. But you can't. There's no mirror behind me. You know right. what I mean? There's right. a mirror for yes. everybody else. There's no mirror for anybody right. on the podium. So I never saw what I looked like, how I presented up there. But you know, I remember riding with my oh my good friend David, who's been a master instructor far longer than I have, and you know, I rode with him and there would all be all these celebrities in class and it was always just like so crazy and People kept saying that, why don't you do this? Why don't you do this? And then one day I was like, yeah, maybe, maybe I will. <laughs> and so I just went to the audition and um, this was like old school. You had to like give your headshots and write your, you know, it was like going to a Hollywood uh, audition. And I made it and went to training in New York and did that for a summer and then got placed in Boston and that mm-hmm. kind of really no. changed the trajectory of the journey yeah. for me. Big time. But if you weren't open to kind of quote starting at the bottom, right? Like you would yeah. from this cushy job to being like okay doing this job that a lot of people might say like I don't want to do that. Yeah. Um, and then like you said, being open to hearing those things, I think is huge. Huge. And I think right now what I hear the most um, in that twenty something range is people are so terrified to get it wrong. Mm. But you have to get it wrong in order to, to get, get it right. right. Like I always say, your, all those little no's will lead you to your jumbo yes. I yes. relate this to putting like bum, uh, the bumpers when you go bowling. Mm. Like if you can bowl with the bumpers yes. or without the bumpers, what are you going to choose? The bumpers, right? Because <laughs> like that's going to lead you closer to that true right. north, whatever that is for yes. you. But you have to be willing to like find those no's and be like, oh my gosh, this job is horrible, but I'm going to stay for like six months. I'm going to see what kind of skills I can like extract out of it and take with me mm-hmm. to the next thing and now I know what my non-negotiables are I will not do this I will not do that I will never forget when I left like a sister world and kind of like move I was like I don't ever want to get anybody's lunch unless it's like we're getting lunch together or whatever I was like I just don't want to get anybody's lunch again and I'll never forget when I went to that next job um a bunch of like you know my teammates or whatever they were at the time I don't even know what they called them I like people I work with, my colleagues, um, they were like, hey, we're going to lunch. And I was like, oh, I, I, like, I didn't know how it works. And they were like, no, like, you guys come with us. Like, we're going to all go together. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is cool. <laughs> yeah, and I remember, it, like, something so silly like that. But again, you learn as you go. And you, you I, I love the saying, like, you got to go to know. Because you do. And mm-hmm. it's impossible to know it until you live it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. There's no other way to do it. Yeah, one of my favorite quotes, and I can't remember, I think it might be Ed Milet, which I'm pretty sure you might, I don't know if if I found him three, but he's literally like (laughs) the best, the fucking best, Yes. obsessed, and the thing that I love, if you don't listen to Ed Milet's podcast, and keep listening to this one, but then after you're done, go check him out, go check him out, because he has also introduced me to so many people, the guests that he has on his show. Yeah. Um, and I'm pretty sure this is him that said it, but forgive me if I'm misquoting, but he basically said that 
answers are a reward for doing shit. Oh, I love that. You have to, so to your point, like you have to take action. You can't just sit all day and like wait for things to come to you. They ain't coming. Yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you, they ain't coming. Yeah, and you just take the job. job. Like, yeah, don't, you know, oh, I, I have this and I have this and it's like, and try to make it do it forever. Yeah. And to your point, like I talk, I talk to a lot of young people too, and they think like, oh, this one decision is going to determine the rest of my life. And it might, it could, but you can have multiple lives. And you can change your mind. You know, at any time. You can change your at mind. At any time. Yeah, like I remember talking to one of my clients who's like 25 and she's like, oh yeah, we're going to go to Coachella. Wait, Olivia, I'm talking to you, girl. Stop. Coachella. She's like, we're going to Coachella because it's the last time we can go. Because like, cause then we have to be grown up. And I was like, oh honey, I just got back from a music yeah, festival. Can, like, you can go at, you can go at 40, <laughs> you can go at 50. Literally. You can go Burning Man like, at 70. Literally. I mean, keep your clothes on, but like, yeah, you can. <laughs> we're done. Like, we're done. Just like, <laughs> let it fly. Let it fly. But to your point, like, it life isn't over at a certain point. Yeah. And if things around you are telling you that, turn them off. Like, if Instagram is telling you that, Mute those people, delete it from your phone, whatever you need to do to get out of that mindset that like life ends at a certain point. Yeah. Like I feel like my life didn't start getting good until I was in my 30s, you know, because I was taking my phones to figure a lot of shit out. It was real messy. Yeah, it was super real messy. messy. You know, I think about this a lot though, when I feel like the I have was having that like come up phase mm-hmm. for myself, like in LA and all this stuff. I honestly think technology and you, you can't you can't not talk about it, you cannot. It's changed everything so much because of that constant comparison narrative mm-hmm. of like, look at what everybody else is doing, yes. look at where everybody else is. Like, we didn't have that. It was just like my head was on my paper and I was just grinding. I was just trying to figure it out. Like, go here, do that. And I didn't, it's like, I, I, not knowing was, like, ignorance was a blessed for us, right? Because That's I didn't know what either. I didn't know what other yes. assistants were doing. I didn't know whatever. Uh, I, I, this happened to me so recently. I remember an assistant I worked with, and you know, we were making zero money when we worked in LA. Like, not great money. I remember like shopping for things at the 99 cent store because I was like, whatever, we're gonna like, try to like go as lean as possible. Yeah. But I remember recently I found out this like this girl's dad is like multi hundred, multi, 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 multi millionaire. And I was like, oh, that's how the F you could uh. live the way you were living. But I didn't know. I didn't and now looking back like, how you like I was but, like, okay. so, I, but here's an example. That would have been detrimental to what I was absolutely. doing at the time. Yes. Because I would have been mm-hmm. comparing myself to this girl. And I was yeah. always kinda like it never occurred to me that we weren't on the same level. Uh-huh. I thought we were all on the same level. Yeah. No, we weren't. Mm-hmm. What kind of apartment was she going back to? Not yeah. just on the floor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But had I known that, I mean, how would that have messed up my drive? Like, mm-hmm. I don't know. And I mm-hmm. think that might be what's happening now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Absolutely. I don't know what how that is, how the how it's going to change or how if people are going to back off of social, if, if it's going to shift in some way, because I really think it, it's, it, it can be used for so much good, but I find more than lately, it's, it go, it drops into the negative. Yeah. Somehow. I think for me, just to speak what I've done personally, because I did get, um, really caught up in that comparison mm-hmm. game when I was in the lead up to open Petaluda and it was really challenging. And so what I did was really curate my social media. And what mm-hmm. I mean by that yeah. is, um, you know, comparison can be a good thing if it's used for inspiration. Exactly. But if it is starting to deplete you and like take it out of you, it's not good. And so, because I would see people, I'm like, fuck, this person's opening up a preferred salon. I'm yeah. like, how the fuck are they doing this? I'm like, like how, I, I'm like, I can't even find a property. Like, yeah. never mind like the cavern to open yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, this is insane. Yeah. But to your point, like, know their situation and I don't know anything about that um and so if I was following someone on social media and I could feel like a visceral reaction mm-hmm. when I was when I was seeing their posts I would just meet them temporarily because I was like this isn't good for me this isn't a feeling I like I don't like it I'm just gonna quietly meet them it doesn't yeah. mean I don't support them in real life it doesn't mean I don't want to cheerlead them but it's not uh helpful for me right now yeah you know and then you know, you go along your journey and you see, like, to your point, like, not everything is as it seems, right? Or, yeah. you know, someone could open up three businesses and have to close two. Like, you don't know. And so... And no one's broadcasting that. Thank you. No one's broadcasting when they close. No one's broadcasting when they 
lose, when they mm-hmm. fail, like it's very, very, um, it's not very common to see. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, and you just don't know anyone else's journey, and so you can't compare yourself to it. So I think the best thing to do is just put your blinders on. And so if that means you either take a break from it or you just curate your social media yeah. to people that are inspiring to you. And I even do that, like, if I see another hairstylist and I'm like, oh, I love their vibe. I'm like, I don't want to, like, accidentally copy a bit or something. I don't know. Yeah. You know, like, weird things like that that I just will curate it down. So that way I know it's good things coming. Yeah. I made, like, a secret page where I... Um, can go to it and my whole feed is just things I want to see because I yeah. think for so long I'm like my my social media on that side because now I'm so curated to business yes. that I don't see anything they want to see. Yeah. Like I don't yeah. pouring back into me. Yeah. So I really yeah. create a secret page yeah. where everything is just curated to what I want to see. Yeah. Whether it's quote pages or whatever and yeah. that's been cool That's great. Yeah. yeah. And I think too if you can use those people for inspiration. Because mm-hmm. I think one of the one of the great questions is like why not me mm. right so if you see someone doing what you want to do why not me like I can do it too I love that you know that was an Alan Beck post was it like, yeah okay no no it was Lisa Licht oh at God, um Meg's event yes yes why not yeah. me why not me yeah. like why yeah. not me yeah you know and so if you can use that and I you know yeah so I just think that's that's really valuable that's a good one why not me bitches why not me why not me Duncan why not me Chris Jenner why not me She's ready in her soul. So, one of the things that I love about you is like exactly that. You talk about the best coaches. What's your idea of the best coach? They don't have it all perfect. They don't have it all right. But they're willing to kind of showcase who they were. I think it's this kind of, I, I think of pictures and I really think of the Wizard of Oz of like the pulling back the curtain mm-hmm. and being like, you know, some people, leaders, whatever, they come off as, this is the great and powerful Oz, ego, like, I'm up here, whatever. But I think the best coaches are really trench proof. And what I mean by that, and I use that a lot, is like willing to get in the trenches mm-hmm. with you because they understand on such a deep, empathetic, and compassionate level where you are because they've walked through that too. Mm-hmm. And so there's this kind of, um, this movement of like, here, let me help you, or like, here, let me grab you and pull you up. I think of like the Jay Z, like, hey, here, let me coach you, or whatever he <laughs> does. Um, like, really, I think of that song. And but it comes from this place of like, I see you, I understand you, I can appreciate where you are, and I've been there too. Like, let me help you. Yeah. Um, you don't have to have everything right. It's being able to say, this is who I am. These are the messes I've had. I don't have all perfect. Hey, don't have the answer right now, but I'll find it for you. I think those make the best leaders and, and coaches. You 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 listen, um, hear people, you see people, and you appreciate them on a deep level. Mm-hmm. I think also you're willing to take messy action. Mm-hmm. I think that you are okay with not having it perfect. It doesn't have to look a certain way. You do things scared, mm-hmm. and then the top thing is you stop making it about you and you make it about them. Mm-hmm. So any of that imposter syndrome, that ego, I would say like ego, ease God out. So mm-hmm. making it about you, not making about them and the bigger picture of service. Um, I think if you follow those things, you're probably on the path to be a very powerful coach in here. Yeah, I want to come back to something that you said, but <laughs> but, but before I do, I want to talk about when you said um, feeling seen because that's something. And um, if you've been listening to me or following me for like even like a fraction of a second, you probably know that I'm very open about like my therapy, my coaching, mm-hmm. like. I've invested a lot of time and money in therapy and coaching throughout my lifetime for yeah. all different reasons, and it's been beyond helpful. But I think one of the hardest uh, things for humans is when they don't feel seen. Yeah. And I'm speaking from personal experience, just for the record. It's really, it's hard. Yeah. I think that you lose, you, there's no connection there. Mm. Mm-hmm. That's what makes people connect. And I call it the Me Too effect. Not like the Me Too movement or whatever. I'm talking about Me Too. Like, yeah. oh my gosh, this person gets me on such a deep level because they've either been where I've been or they understand in some way, shape, or form like the way I'm feeling or they have that level to deeply connect with you through that experience. Mm-hmm. So I oftentimes say like when you're looking for a coach, you want to find someone that you really – you, you feel seen by you feel like oh my gosh this person gets me and it creates this immediate sense of no like and trust it's like this mm-hmm. deep connection 
because that is what I mean. That is connection. It is yeah. like I see you. Mm-hmm. I think I heard y'all say that the other day in Soul Hit. Yeah. Like I see you. I see what you're doing. I see yeah. you. I see you. Because mm-hmm. it's so important. Because I think when people don't feel seen, it just like breaks any level of trust, any level of connection, mm-hmm. um, and it's really hard to get that back. I think. Yeah, definitely. And I think too when you know, mentor, mentee, coach, student, like whatever the relationship is, when you feel seen, then you are also willing to be pushed because mm-hmm. you know it's coming from a place of value. You and know? love. And love, exactly. And you do, as a coach, and, you know, I'm talking about you specifically, push people with love. And that is what makes you want to work harder because it's like, you're like, you want – if you say that during soul hit, you're like, I kind of want you to be like a little pissed off at me. Like, I want you like hate me a little bit. Just like a little bit, but not too just much. Just like the like, oh, let's show her. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because then it gets you to, because you're like pissed off, like, yes, I'm doing this, but also like, I kind of want to make you proud, girl. Yeah, but I kind of like you. Yeah, I think that that's really true. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I wish I had an, a good answer for like how to create that secret sauce and like bottle it up. Yeah. And, give it to everybody else. Um, but I think it really just goes back to really being able to deeply connect mm-hmm. with people, um, to see them. And I think that like really goes back to the beginning of like nurturing those relationships, yeah. getting to know people. Like, do you see this person for a person for what they bring? Have they told you stories? Do they trust you? Did they confide in you? There's mm-hmm. so much wrapped in it. But I think when you know someone's story, like you know a little bit about them, you know about their family, like you, the relationships go so, so deep within soul and I think within my community and anything I've really built. And I know probably the same for you behind the chair. Like, you learn so much about people. And when you remember that and when you use that to also coach and, like, help play into their lives, like, I think a lot of times in class I'll say something that I know someone in the room is going through in that very moment or I know the doors are going to open up to the salon or whatever it is. It's, like, being able to remember those things and play on them and help, again, like, extract that greatness out of somebody because you know them on such a deep level and you remember that, mm-hmm. that's really what like takes somebody to the next level. And you can give that like extra push, but it's not coming from like a, I'm going to shut you off the cliff. It's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, come with me. Yeah. One of my favorite quotes and it's by my strength coach, Tony Gentlefloor, okay. who is amazing. And he coaches other coaches. So he like travels the world and trains other trainers. And mm-hmm. one of the things that he says is, you have to give a shit and people know it when they see it. Mm. And it's the same for every, every job, relationship. It can be applied to literally everything in life. And something that I always talk about when I'm training people behind the chair in the salon is that you have to give a shit and it's okay. Like these relationships are going to toe the line. Like we're running a business, right? You're running a business. And I think that a lot of times there's this like, well, that people feel not genuine about it. It's like, no, you can care for your clients genuinely. Clients, riders, you know, coaches, like whatever, and whatever, right. interchangeable, right? And still run your business with integrity. Mm. Like those things can coexist. It's not one or the other. Yeah. You know, and I think sometimes people are like, oh, I don't know how to describe it, but like, oh, like, you know, you're, you're like getting money from people. So that means that like, I had any to be weird about the relationship or vice versa. It's like, no, this, you can do both. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's not. You can do all the things. Yeah. Does that make sense? I, I think it makes total sense. I feel like I sometimes feel aligned because I feel like I make everyone my friend. <laughs> like, everyone's my friend. Yeah. But I think that's a testament to the way you make people feel. Right. And that's where the line can get a little gray, I think, sometimes right. in business. But I would rather have that happen and maybe have to like be better about my own boundaries or what I'm doing yeah. they never feel that like what a great blessing and problem to have right. people feel so connected and close yes. to me that I actually have to be better <laughs> about my own boundaries because everybody just otherwise I'm just like an open like siphon of energy all the time everybody which gosh I wish if it wasn't in, like if it was infinite I'd be yeah. great I'd be great again okay, bottle it up billion dollar business <laughs> but yeah. um, you have to be careful and but like what a problem to have totally so. Yeah. Well, I think that you do, that is something that you do so well on your social media. And that's why people feel like they know you Yeah, is because you do share like the good, bad, the ugly, you share all of Madison and that's why people feel connected to you and feel like they're your bestie because you're like talking to your camera. You're like, it's like, we're talking to our friend walking down the street, you know, which is why it's part of how you build your community. 
community. Yeah, and why people feel so connected to you. Yeah, it's, it's a show. It yeah, it is, and that's why that's why people feel so connected, which is amazing. So I think that that's awesome. But you, I imagine, are also like a bit strategic sometimes mm -hmm. about what you do and don't share. Is that? Yeah, I think you have to be. I think um, one of what you know, it's so interesting. I think there's been different times in my life where I've shared a little more, shared a little less, and. The, the, it, again, like, it is such a bel delicate balance yes, because then there's people that just like share mm -hmm. and it's just like, just like soul sludge, it's just mm -hmm. like law and you're just kind of like sharing all your, like airing out all your crap and mm -hmm. that doesn't come off like purposeful mm -hmm. and I like, think you have to be, it's an art. Yeah, I think absolutely. it's really an art. I think there's times where I've shared in the spot, like one of, I talk about this all the time because it was just such a massive um, failure publicly for me was like when I didn't make Patriots Truly. That was such a massive failure publicly to everybody, to thousands and thousands and thousands of people that were following along this like crazy whatever journey. But I think being able to share that in the moment was really powerful. But I can also attest to things like sometimes things have happened to me and you have to share from the scar, not the wound. I say mm. like if you're it's just that big gaping wound, like letting it all come out, sometimes that's it's it's not helpful. Yeah, because you, you have to, similar to like an actual wound, you have to heal a so that you, bit. a little bit so that you can process it. And so you can, you have to heal a little bit and figure out a little bit in your journey so then if your goal and intention is to serve and inspire and lead people who might have gone through a similar thing, mm -hmm. then you can speak to it mm -hmm. kind of, um, and not in like authority, but with a little more conviction and mm -hmm. kind of grappling through it. And, and it can vary. It doesn't have to be one or the other. It's really like up to you where you are in it. Right. There's been times where I'm in the moment sharing and then I was like, mm, I'm not sure about this one for yeah. a second. Yeah. Have you ever had a moment where you like post something and then you're like, oh, I think I gotta take it down? Not really. No? No. Okay. No. Um, I think over the years, I think before, I think my page was so much more fun and crazy and like just like a fly off the cuff. And to be honest, I missed that a little bit. I wanted it back to that. But I also think that we live now in a different kind of world where everybody is extremely sensitive and like I think like it's you could say the wrong thing at any moment and that creates this level of fear of like did I say the wrong thing is somebody going to misconstrue this or take my words and make it something that it's not like I don't think it's as carefree and fun anymore you have yeah. to be so careful about what you say and how you say it and is this going to offend somebody I think Again, I, going back to that like, really big pendulum flip, I think it's swung really far one way to mm -hmm. almost like fear of like doing the wrong thing, saying the wrong thing, like mm -hmm. I'm gonna get canceled, is this gonna happen? Mm -hmm. so yeah, I know that is really interesting. It yeah. is and especially it's like the bigger your audience, the more likely or like yeah. the more possible that it is to happen. Yeah. Um, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Super interesting. <laughs> I'm like, who are we gonna piss off? Today? Yeah, we're gonna piss off. the last. <laughs> no, but yeah, sometimes I do like low key want to be a soul cycle instructor, but I'm like, yeah. I don't know if I, because you have to like go and do the whole training and then come back and I literally want to teach like one or two classes. Yeah. Like, but just with my background in dance, I always feel like I'm so used to counting the beats of it's music. Helpful. It's helpful. And so a lot of times I can anticipate like what's coming next or when a segment okay. is going to end. Yeah, like this is so, okay, so this is really important. So I, I oftentimes forget that I went to school for music. I went to school for entertainment and music business. I played instruments my whole life. I danced my whole life. I cheered my whole life. Yeah. All of that plays so much into so what I do. Much. People are like, well, how are you? How are you good at this? Or how did you? How did you really hone in on this skill? And sometimes I, I like. I forget that all those past versions of myself have it helped me up too. now. That's yes. why I can do what I do. That's why the musicality sounds the way it does. Mm -hmm. And that's why things flow and you hear things differently because of my musical ear. Like, right. you're going to hear this pitch into another song or a piano into a piano. Like, I'm very picky yeah. about my sound. And it makes a huge difference. It it's, does. It's obvious. Yes. I will say it's it obvious. It makes a huge like, difference. It's literally for me like doing a concert or like art or like mm -hmm. literally DJing a set. Like, everything mm -hmm. has to flow and sound really great. And that all comes from my background. Which was how we leave music. So yeah. all these little things, so these breadcrumbs are like clues to who you are now and how that plays into what you do. Well, that's what very similarly, like 
I went to Northeastern and I studied psychology and communications. Okay. <laughs> and I remember when I was going to hair school, literally, someone was really? like, so, they're, they're like, oh, well, like, do you feel bad that, like, you don't use your degree? And I was like, but I use it every day. day. Exactly. Like, literally every day. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, no, it's literally exactly applicable. Yeah. But, yeah, I love it. And I just love that, too, because I was on a drill team, like I talked about. And, like, no big deal, but we were a third. Which is in Maryland. And the sport. Um, like, I don't, that's it. <laughs> and we did, like, the flags and no, stuff. No, that's cool. So, but you so you get a sequined outfit? Yeah. I mean, that do you know what the bad thing was? So, like, <laughs> drill team was the only sport at our school that wasn't funded by the school. So, oh, we had nice. to self-fund. We didn't even have a coach. We were self-coached. And, and by last year, yeah, literally, we would do, like, fundraising car washes. Oh, like, yeah. Wash I so, anyways, the point being, we didn't get to keep any of our costumes. They all, like, yeah. went back to be, like, recycled, which, like, what the fuck. But then we would have a coach. Usually in the summers, we would hire a coach for, like, a week-long camp yeah. like, from one of the, like, Towson University or whatever to come because I grew up in Maryland, whatever. da 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 And, but isn't that crazy? Like, a self coach like, the students, we literally, I forget what we were called, but there was, like, a group of students that, like, so you already um, were a like choreographed no and like yeah. did all this stuff. Yeah. It's crazy. You built a business in high school around this sport. <laughs> you are like, wait, hey, how did I do this on a real journey? I just was practicing when I was 15. But we used to, I need to see, I can't do it in jeans, but one of what we used to do to stretch, because we did high kicks, like the yeah. football game, like whatever football basketball game and we would stand against the wall because we practiced in the hallways of our high school because we didn't actually get gym time yeah <laughs> and one girl would stand with her back against the wall and the other girl would like push your leg up yeah. to touch the wall yeah so i don't know if i could touch my foot to the wall behind me but pretty it's like that, my party trick that, that would be gone for me what's now. your marching band <laughs> party trick my party trick i usually when people are like tell us something interesting around you so i played saxophone for a very very long time I also played a lot of different woodwinds, flute, oboe, oh, like all of the things. So um, that would be my party trick, maybe. Or I think that's like one of the most interesting, like old facts about me that people like, wouldn't guess. Well, because I'm also like, how did you do marching band and cheerleading? Because so like, I got to do both. Time. I got kind of like a little bit like so I didn't have to play with the jazz band on our football oh, okay. games because I was be I was like out of cheering, but I could have. I could have just like done both. I think I might have so on like one cool. or two occasions I love that. had my saxophone and like stopped and played. Up. I don't remember. I'd have to like ask. I'd have to go back to ask. Like, so I feel like I did that, but you know how sometimes with <laughs> memories you're like, did I actually just make that up? Did I just like make up a movie <laughs> well, in my it's head? It's so funny because not for the technology, like my dad one time dropped off all these. I wish I had more tape. I wish I had more. And yeah. I actually, like, it was during COVID, and it was my birthday, and whatever. Anyways, he dropped off all his tapes, and I watched them, and I was like, damn, we were really good. Yeah, it's cool. But I was like, I think that's me. Maybe not. I was like, I can't tell that was me. It's yeah. so funny. Yeah, no, it's crazy. Uh, well, you've had such a journey, and I love crazy. hearing, like, all these tidbits <laughs> and everything that got to you to where you are now. And I would love to hear a little bit more about what you're doing because something that you did recently that I really respect and you shared it like kind of quietly mm. um, and it was funny because I went back and I was like wait did I ever comment on Madison's post about that because I want to give her like a big round of applause and like publicly like acknowledge yeah, her yeah, yeah. and then I was like I don't think she made a post about it you did it really quietly as you cut way back on the amount of classes that you were teaching yeah so that was honestly something I was thinking about for a while because I think, you know, I hate talking about COVID because I'm like, ugh, mm. I'm just so over having to talk about that, but it was such a big, it, it made everybody take different turns mm. that we never would have. Mm. And so for me, like, I built this whole entire coaching business beyond the bike during that time. And then when the bike came back, you know, it went away for a while, right. I call it like my snapback. I'm a big like Marvel fan and I think yeah. of like Thanos <laughs> with the snap, but different for me and opposite of like, Again, when I talk about energy and that siphoning of energy, it was like I was going 120 miles an hour in this business, and then like soul just came back full swing. Mm. So it was I was like, doing everything all the time, working seven days a week, doing everything all the time, and now I'm at a. I just got to a point where I was like, if I want to do more of what I like really want to do now, I, I'm going to have to pull back energetically from Soul Cycle. I have to. I can't do yeah. both right now. And this goes back to what we were saying about that can change. Mm -hmm. And for so long, I was like, well, if I go down, then like, what? What if I make up? And it's like, okay, well, then you can just add more back. Right. You get 
to create the life of your own design mm. if you are in a place and you're fortunate enough to do that, which I am. So I'm very grateful for that. So yeah, I went down from like, I think I was at 10, you know, I used to be at like 20, 18, 16, 12, you know, but after you've done it for so long, you start to come back. And my mindset around going down was to give myself full days to work on just my business. So it's so funny. Everybody's like, how are your date? Like, how is your time off now? And I'm like, it's actually being spent on how it was like fully full on working, mm -hmm. but it's just, I don't have to be energetically siphoned mm -hmm. with the performance of soul mm -hmm. during that day. Yeah. Because I would love to say, oh, I can just show up and it's a workout and I can sweep it under the rug, which I kind of did in a sense. I was like, whatever, soul's on autopilot, like I can just show up. But it, I wasn't really taking into account how much energy I was taking. Mm -hmm. And then as I was booking more events and speaking engagements and things like that, I was finding myself having to call out of the same classes over and over. And I'm like, what are we doing here? It was right. kind of like that divine pendulum shift of like, this has to go down a little if this is going to soar a little more and really figuring that out. But that's very challenging and it took me a really long time to finally make that decision. Mm -hmm. Because like anybody else or any other really hard working driven person, mm -hmm. you're like, no, I can do it all. I can, mm -hmm. you know, and then you get to a point where I'm like, okay, something's gotta get, I have to figure this out. Mm -hmm. If I want this to soar, I have to like pull back here. Yeah. Or how do I manage this energetically so I can show up as the best version of myself and serve and inspire and that's what I was finding like I would teach two classes and then I would go do an event where I would talk and like try to be all that I could and I'm great at doing that and quote unquote like mm -hmm. my, my dad says this all the time Matt's like nobody actually knows how you feel because you are really good at performing right. and he'll say that like if I have a migraine or whatever I, I have the ability to push through that is the performer and true athlete in me it can be a great thing and it can also be somewhat of a detrimental thing. Absolutely. Um, and, and it just it just depends what hat you're wearing that day and, and energetically. Going back to energy, so I said this on a podcast recently and I don't really want to copyright it because I'm like, this is stupid, but like your energy is your edge. Mm. And what I was finding is I was giving, it, it, like, it, it's not infinite. Mm -hmm. And so when I made that final decision, that's when I was able to just do more beyond the bike, which is really what I want to do. What I love to do is coach and teach and do workshops and speak on stage and keynote and do all these other things. Um, and that's really where I'm putting a lot of my energy now. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And I think too, it comes, there's, um, um, why am I not finding my words today? Not, there's imposter syndrome. Oh, a scarcity mindset. Right? Oh yeah. Because yeah. this is the same thing for hairstylists, right? And when I was early in my career, I was coming in late. I was staying late. I was working yes. six days a week, seven days a week. I would come out. I was doing on location. I was da, 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 everywhere, here, there, everywhere. And it was a scarcity mindset that like if I, and, and you know, and it's tough because like we're talking about words, a fine line. You do have to work hard. Yeah. In the beginning. A really fine line. You do have to grind, but until what point? And until what point do you say, I'm okay taking a step back here, and I'm okay if some of these clients go to that other stylist, because I know that my goals are over here. Yeah. And if I'm dumping all my energy into, whether it's like a million soul cycle classes or, you know, working 12 plus hour days behind, behind the chair, chair. Yeah. You, you don't have any energy left to give to what your passion is, and you'll never get there. So it's really inspiring that you found that. And I love that. Your energy is your edge, and it's so true. Yeah. So you got to save a little bit. Yeah, you have to. And then you want to go, then you want to go do like also things that fill you up. Mm -hmm. So, and you have Absolutely. to, you only get so much. There's only 24 hours. Energy. <laughs> yeah. So you have yeah. to be really conscious of mm -hmm. how you are, what your output and input is. Absolutely. So yeah. that was what made that decision, but it was hard. I sat on that decision for two years. Mm -hmm. Literally. Yeah. No, I'm like, yeah. yeah. Every time of like, yeah. and to me too, it was about preservation because I used to joke with Scott all the time. I was like, I feel like I'm just going to wake up on a Tuesday and I'm going to walk away. Yeah. Because I'm just so exhausted. I'm so burnt out and I'm so tired. Mm -hmm. And now all of those characteristics made me who I am. Mm -hmm. Those 20 classes a week, I wouldn't be who I am without, like, like going back to everything you've said. Absolutely. But then you get to this point, after a decade, mm -hmm. keyword, after a decade, yeah. where you're like, okay, now I now I have to figure it out. Because yeah. now it needs to be self-sustaining and it needs to fulfill mm -hmm. me. Absolutely. Also, it can't just be whatever. Yeah. For a time, that can be yeah. Absolutely. Right? You need to get to the point. You need to build. You need to mm -hmm. do then you get to the point of, oh, now it's this, like, softening mm -hmm. a little bit into it and, like, letting go in certain places. And that took me, that 
took me, I sat on that decision for a while. Like, these things don't happen overnight. Like, the internet no. makes them out to be your own. Oh, absolutely. You know, like, I mean, whatever people see. I'm 16 years behind the chair. Yeah. I've been working in salons for over 20 years. I started when I was two. Um, I do. <laughs> <laughs> two years but, and 16 years behind the chair, right? Yeah. And it wasn't until the last couple, and then when I opened Petaluda, on Wednesdays, I start work at 11. Mm. Do you know why? Because you go to Soul <laughs> and, <laughs> and then you get coffee. And then you get coffee. And then, and and then I like get walk it off. And exactly. <laughs> and then I come to work. And, you know, Celine, every Wednesday, she's like, how's class this morning? Like, everyone knows that is what I right. need. And I, if I were showing up here at 8 a.m. every morning, I'm not going to be the best leader. No. I'm not going to be the best hairstylist. I'm not going to be the best friend. I'm going to be shitty because I'll be burnt out and tapped out. So to your point, yeah, you put in the work in the beginning so that you can yeah. ease off the gaps a little bit in yeah. some areas and then just put it, you know, in the other areas. Yeah. So what is next? For Madison, <laughs> number one, number two, and what stage are we meeting on? Because oh gosh, let's go. <sighs> What's next? Um, so I would like to keep growing uh, what I'm doing with speaking, and whether that be on stages, but I also have worked with some really awesome companies and brands and mm-hmm. colleges here where I've gotten brought in and done workshops that way, um, which has been really cool. And uh, it's just it's it's what I do at soul but it's just in a different arena it's like a different stage it's a different place it's with different demographics and people so it keeps it like fun and fresh and how oh, what stage are you gonna be on oh my god i don't know i just like, close my i just like close my eyes and i just want it to be like bi- like bigger yeah. um you know i i sat on a lot of panels and i love doing panels but panels don't scare the shit out of me yeah. because i'm very comfortable and I, and I, to a test i'm very comfortable in front of people you know mm-hmm. i get up in front of hundreds of people a day mm-hmm. so yes it takes a larger scale i think stage and room to really make me shake in my boots so that would be cool to feel this mm-hmm. year um and then i'm probably going to revamp my gratitude practice journal um i'm gonna do a hardcover edition which i'm working on which is really fun because that has been such a game changer in my life Mm -hmm. gratitude in the morning and Mm -hmm. i'll probably do a workshop and things around that and um i love that yeah Yeah, i can attest to that too because i'm a big journaler and i I like stacks and stacks of journals of and it's gratitude mixed with goals mixed with all of it. So yeah. your gratitude journal is amazing. Thank you. So if you don't already have it, you can <laughs> purchase it on Amazon. <laughs> it's uh, wildly capable, <laughs> wicked, fearless. Mm-hmm. And um, just kind of going to keep working on my group coaching and expanding and just see how I can put some new things maybe. Not like I don't like the word autopilot, but I want to – my biggest um, downfall is systems and tech. Mm. It always – it's just not – I don't love it. It's mm-hmm. not where I excel, and it's really getting like hiring and having help with those things that mm-hmm. I'm not as great at, yep. so that the business can run smoothly without me having to do all of the things. Yes, and I think so many people can adjust that. Like, how can I streamline what I'm doing now to make it better, mm-hmm. so I can kind of just like show up and be the creative mm-hmm. motivation, whatever it is, the energetic edge on stage, and not have to do all yeah. like, you know, absolutely whatever. Yeah, that's why we have it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, among other things. Yeah, and tech people. And, uh, yeah. you know, I don't know. Like here. Make it work. Please, make it work for me. Exactly. Well, this has been so awesome. Yes. Thank you so much. It's been such a fun to be like a passenger in your coaching ship <laughs> and also to watch your journey. Because, like I said, you've helped me personally immensely, which is um, like a, just such an incredible coach. So I'm eternally grateful for that and the community that you have built because I've met just the most amazing people within your community. That's incredible. So thank you personally for that. And um, tell people where they can find you. Yeah, well, thank you for the kind words. I received that. Another thing I'm working on receiving, when you give so much, you also have to learn how to receive. Mm-hmm. Um, people can find me on Instagram mm-hmm. at um, Mads Tads, M-A-D-D-Z, T-A-D-D-Z, as we were talking about before. <laughs> my last name is Chaconi, my maiden name, which is also Madonna's. And my new married name is Corello, so either way, it's going to be super Italian, and we'll see um, where it goes with the name. But for now, it's at Mads Tads. It's at www.madstads.com is the website. 
And the journal, like you said, on Amazon Prime, Wild Be Capable, Wicked Fearless, yeah. and the podcast is called Wicked Fearless. So, yeah. so kind of all tune in, fearless, tune in, tabs. tap in, there's coaching <laughs> tap in, <laughs> tap in. There's opportunities <laughs> to get coached personally. Yeah. And if that's not uh, possible for you right now, you can get coached, you know, like I said, virtually. So many, through there's, the so many there's so many There's so many ways to yeah. do a podcast, but get on it. Don't, don't sleep on Madison, y'all. Yeah, don't sleep. Because otherwise she's coming to a stage near you. Yeah, soon. Fingers <laughs>